Hello, welcome. This is the second lecture in this course. I am Professor and I am happy to be your tutor. This lecture is a continuation of the previous one, so if you haven't watched it yet, then please kindly do so so that you can enjoy this lecture. All right, let's get started. In the previous lecture, we learned that matter manifests in different states. Um, however, on Earth, the three of these states are dominant. They are li solid, liquid, and gases. We also learned that all these states have something in common. Uh, that is, they are made up of tiny particles called atoms. And um, these atoms are actually the basic unit of matter. Now, by basic unit of matter, we mean that they form the building blocks of matter. Now, in electronics, we are mostly concerned about solids. So let's focus on the solid state for now. You have heard me mention atoms, subatomic particles. If you also have a science background, you probably know of or have heard about orbitals and shells and subshells and also electric charge. Now, in this lecture, we are going to look at these things and the role they play in electronics. Moving forward, let me remind you that we are still in the business of answering the question, how does the light bulb work? And at the same time, we are laying a solid foundation for electronic systems design. Now, back to atoms. When we zoom into an atom, we see two regions. Uh, the central region and an area around the central region. Now, the central region is what we call the nucleus. The nucleus contains two different types of particles. They are the protons and the neutrons. Now, the protons and neutrons are collectively called nucleons. Every atom contains a unique number of protons. In fact, it is the number of protons that actually identifies the type of atom. Now, the number of neutrons of a specific atom is not unique. For instance, um, in an atom with 12 protons, there can be a variant with uh, 12 neutrons and another with 14 neutrons. Now, this is the concept of isotopes. An isotope refers to atoms of the same element with the same pro number of protons but different number of neutrons. Now, the number of protons in an atom is known among scientists as the atomic number and it is represented by the letter Z. The number of neutrons is also called the neutron number, sometimes represented by N, but this is not a standard. Now, when you sum the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, you get what we call the mass number, which is also represented by the letter capital A. Now, Protons and neutrons don't really play any role in electronics, hence uh, they are not of interest for our course. Now, let's veer off track to take care of some definitions. We will come back. When we defined matter, we said that matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. Now, the space occupied by matter is called its volume. Now, the mass of an object, however, is not easy to define in terms of other things. This is because mass is a fundamental property of matter. In your textbook, you would see something like mass is defined as the amount of substance or matter a body contains. Now, do you see where the problem is? Uh, there is some kind of cyclic definition. Because we define matter in terms of mass, and we are also defining mass in terms of matter. Okay, so to give you an understanding of what I need you to know, uh, I'm going to make some assumptions. Uh, to get a sense of mass, uh, think of heaviness. Now, heaviness is actually a measure of weight, which is a force. Now, in the definition of weight, um, we, we multiply the mass of the body by a constant known as the acceleration due to gravity, which is represented by the letter small g. Now, acceleration due to gravity is the same for a particular location, right? So, so far as I am within the same location, all objects 
ideally will receive the same amount of this acceleration due to gravity. Therefore, so far as we compare the heaviness of these objects at the same place, we can relate the sense of heaviness to their masses. However, it is essential that you take note of this assumption that I have made. So, we will casually refer to the mass of an object as its heaviness. Now, let's take a balloon and an orange for instance. By inspection, we can see that the balloon is bigger than the orange. However, the orange is heavier than the balloon. Hence, not every big thing is heavy. Of course, there is an exception because if you compare an elephant and a dog, the elephant is both bigger and heavier than the dog, right? So, it is not convenient to guess the heaviness of objects just by inspection. As we have seen, some things can be heavier but what smaller. We can actually normalize or rectify this by eliminating the influence of the size of the object, okay? Mathematically, uh, we can achieve this by dividing the mass of the object by the size or by its volume. Now, when we do this, the resulting value happens to be a property of the material. Now, the mass per unit volume is actually the definition of a physical quantity called density. So, instead of worrying about the heaviness of different objects with different sizes, you can actually compare their densities as their sizes do not affect their densities. So from the definition of density, uh, we can see that as volume increases, uh, density decreases. Mathematically, uh, we, call, we, we say that they are inversely proportional. So density is inversely related to volume. However, for the mass, as mass, the mass of the object increases, so does its density. And mathematically, we say that they are directly proportional. Now, a typical application of density is what makes ship float in water. Uh, the ship is heavy and uh, bigger in size, right? However, there are a lot of empty spaces within the ship that actually adds up to its volume. Hence, when we compute the density of the ship, you realize that we get something very lower. In fact, the density of the ship is lower than the density of water. Hence, the ship is able to float in water. Now, back on track, the proton and the neutron have the same mass of about uh, 1.67 uh, times 10 raised to the power minus 27 kilograms, right? Now, this value is actually very small. However, uh, the protons and the neutrons together form almost the entire mass of the atom, but then they occupy a smaller space. In fact, the volume or the, the space occupied by uh, the nucleus, uh, it's almost insignificant, okay? compared to uh, the entire size of the atom. Hence, when we compute the, the density of the nucleus, you get something very high. Therefore, we say that the nucleus of an atom is very dense. Now, in the nucleus of the atom, the protons and the neutrons are held together by a strong force called the nuclear force. Uh, details of the nuclear force is actually beyond the scope of this lecture, so uh, I won't go further into that. Now, outside of the nucleus, we see another type of particle called the electron. So, the proton, electron, and neutron are actually referred to as subatomic or fundamental or elementary particles. Now, take note that there are other elementary particles, but we will only concentrate on uh, these ones, protons, electrons, and neutrons. Now, unlike protons and neutrons, which are confined in a very little space within the nucleus, electrons actually occupy a much wider space. In fact, the, the size of the atom is entirely the space occupied by the electrons, okay? So, like protons and neutrons, the electron also has a mass. And the mass of the electron is um, typically about 9.109 uh, times 10 raised to the power minus 30, 
limited to one kilogram. Yes. Now, compared to the mass of a proton or a neutron, you realize that the mass of a proton is about 1,836 times greater than the mass of the electron. Hence, coupled with the larger volume they occupy, the density of the electrons is negligible. Okay? It's almost insignificant. So in the atom, the electrons actually move around the nucleus in specific paths that we call shells. More on shells later. Now, in every atom, there is an equal number of protons and electrons. For instance, an atom with 12 protons will also have 12 electrons. Now, there is a fundamental physical property of elementary particles that we call electric charge. Uh, actually, um, we don't know much about electric charges. However, there are three simple postulates or observations, if I may say, which are backed by experimental observations that tells us about the behavior of electric charge. Now, first of all, we know that there is a fundamental physical property of elementary particles called the charge. It exists. Okay? Uh, this physical property develops a force called the Coulomb force between the elementary particles that carry it. Now, we also know that uh, the more of this charge that we have, the stronger the force that develops between the elementary particles. The force due to the electric charge can actually be, be measured, okay? And uh, electric charge is also measured in the unit of coulombs. Now, the, the Coulomb force was actually first uh, measured by a scientist called Charles Augustine Coulomb. And uh, because of that, the unit of electric charge was named after him. Now, second, the second thing we know about this uh, electric charge is the fact that uh, they come in two different types. We have the positive and the negative. And the force that develops between charges of the same type is repulsive. Uh, hence, if I have two positive charges or two negative charges, they, they tend to repel each other. Now, when the charges are opposite, the, the force that develops between them tends to be attractive. That means that a positive charge will always attract a negative charge and vice versa. Now, also, this electric charge we know to be quantized. Now, what do we mean by quantized? Uh, when we say that something is quantized, it means that we can only have certain amounts of it. Okay. For instance, you cannot have a half of a human being, right? You cannot say that, okay, I need uh, three and a half boys to come to me, or I need uh, five and quarter girls to come around, right? You can only have... Uh, integer multiples of human beings so two people three people one person in that order okay similarly you can only have a certain amount of this charge that is why we say that it is what quantized okay you can only have a certain amount of an elementary value of the charge and finally we also know that this charge is conserved now what this means is that there is a finite amount of electric charge in the entire universe and you cannot actually create new charges you can't also annihilate them the only thing you could probably do is neutralize them and actually to neutralize a charge all it takes is to add um, the same quantity of the opposite charges to it okay now subatomic particles can carry electric charge now the are often referred to as charge carriers because they themselves are not the charges, okay? They can carry the charge. Take, for instance, the capsules for packaging medicine, right? So the capsule can actually contain the medicine, but the capsule itself is not the medicine. So protons tend to be positively charged. Electrons tend to be negatively charged. However, the neutrons, as you can probably uh, uh, sniff from its name, the, the neutron tends to have no charge. It is ne electrically neutral. Now, 
the, the, the magnitude of the charge of an electron is about minus 1.602 times 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb and fortunately enough this is actually the value of the elementary charge okay so any charged particle or particles can only have an integer multiple of this elementary charge so a proton for instance has a charge equal in magnitude as that of an electron except that it has an opposite chair okay now to make life easier we represent the magnitude of an elementary charge by the letter e hence uh, instead of writing the 1.602 times there is a power minus 19 coulomb we just write something like minus 1 e for electron and positive 1 e for the proton because charge is quantized, we said that we can only have an integer multiple of the elementary charge, right? So we can have something like 2e, 3e, 5e, minus 8e, etc., right? However, this is not entirely true because uh, within the atoms, there are some subatomic particles called quarks, right? And it happens that these quarks can actually have a fractional uh, amount of the elementary charge and it's usually one third of the elementary charge but then uh, they, these are still quantized because a quark can only have uh, an integer multiple of one third of the elementary charge right so that means that the, the quantization of charge is still what justified now, the subject of charge is actually beyond the scope of this course, so enough of that. Now, because neutrons have no charge, the nucleus is entirely positively charged, and the total charge of the nucleus is the sum of the charges of all the protons. I said earlier that in every atom, the number of protons equals to the number of electrons, right? So this means that an atom with 12 protons will also have 12 electrons. Now, since the charges are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, what happens is the total positive effect of the protons is cancelled or balanced by the total negative effect of the neutrons. Hence, the entire atom becomes electrically neutral. That is to say that uh, the atom itself has no net charge, although it contains charged particles. Now, the positively charged nucleus tends to pull the negatively charged electrons onto itself because of the Coulomb force of attraction between them. However, the electron under normal conditions does not get pulled into the nucleus by the proton. Now, this is because of um, the fact that electrons could not just take on any objects they want. Uh, Instead, they are locked into uh, orbits with specific distances from the nucleus. Now, this is according to a model proposed by a scientist called Niels Bohr. Now, he also proposed that there is a minimum distance electron an electron could reach closer to the nucleus, uh, after which it cannot move any closer to the nucleus. By the way, uh, this is the subject of atomic physics and we are not particularly interested in the details for now. So our interest is in the fact that electrons are grouped and confined to move at specific distances about the nucleus, okay? Now, these regions of space where there is a higher probability of locating an electron around the atom is called shells. Shells are also called energy levels. Now, depending on the energy of a particular electron, it will exist in a particular shell that matches its energy. Now, the closer a shell is to the nucleus, the lower its energy. Okay. Now, if you look at the shells, uh, they, they are labeled from inside out, right? With the, close, the shell closest to the nucleus labeled as the K shell. Also, the position of a shell is called principal quantum number and it's represented by the letter M. Hence, the K shell, which is the first shell, has a principal quantum number of one. 
Now, the next shell is called the L shell, and it has a principal contour number of two in that order. Now, the shell closest to the nucleus has the lowest energy, and electrons fill up lower energy shells before the higher ones. Now, in chemistry, this is known as the Ogbo principle. This means that the K shell gets filled before the L shell, before the M shell, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, the farther a shell is from the nucleus, the larger it is. And uh, the larger a shell is, the more electrons it can hold, and the higher the energies of those electrons, okay? So the first shell, which is the K shell, can hold only two electrons. The L shell can hold a maximum of eight, and the uh, M shell can hold a maximum of 18, and so on. Now, the way you calculate this is by using the formula 2 times n squared, right? Where n is the principal quantum number of the shell. Now, within a shell, electrons can be further grouped into subshells. Now, there are four different types of subshells labeled S, P, D, and F in order of increasing uh, energies. Now, the number of subshells is actually equal to the quantum number of the main shell. Okay, so the K shell, which has a quantum number of one, has just one subshell. The L shell, with a quantum number of two, has two subshells, which is the S and P subshells. Uh, M shell, which has a quantum number of Three, uh, a principal quantum number of three has three subshells, that is S, P, and D subshells in that order, okay? Again, within the subshells, electrons can be grouped into orbitals, okay? So take note that inside a shell, it's a subshell, and inside a subshell, it's an orbital, okay? Now, each orbital can actually hold up to two electrons but they must have opposite spins, meaning uh, one should point up and the other points down. Now, this is what is known as the Pauli exclusion principle, okay? Now, uh, details of orbitals are in the subject of chemistry and not of much interest to us. Now, in electronics, we are only concerned about the outermost shell. Now, the outermost shell is also called the valence shell, and the electrons in the outermost shell are called valence electrons. Uh, our interest is in the valence electrons. Now, this is because in electronics and even in uh, uh, chemi chemical reactions, only the electrons uh, in the valence shell partake in these activities. Now, the, the, the way we arrange or distribute electrons in shells around the, uh, the nucleus of the atom is something we call electron configuration, okay? Now, the electrical and even the chemical properties of materials actually depend on the valence electrons of its atoms. Now, in the previous lecture, I mentioned that when atoms of the same kind come together, uh, they form an element. Now, naturally, many types of atoms do not exist freely in nature on their own, okay? So what, they, what happens is that they tend to combine to form elements or molecules. A molecule is a chemical combination of two or more atoms uh, that forms the basic unit of another substance. For instance, Water is made up of what we call water molecules, okay? And a typical water molecule consists of one hydrogen atom bounded to two oxygen atoms. Now, as of the time of recording this lecture, there are about 118 known elements, okay? But uh, out of these, 94 of them are naturally occurring uh, on Earth. The rest were created in the lab. Now, Elements have unique names and symbols. The, the symbols that we use to identify or we associate with the various elements uh, are called chemical symbols. Now, each element has certain properties that distinguish it from another, okay? Naturally, some elements exist in the form of gases. Others are metals, some are non-metals, and others are metalloids. To make it easier for reference, scientists have actually arranged these known elements according to uh, their increasing atomic numbers in a tabular form called the periodic table. 
All right, this is a good point to end this lecture. Note that we are gradually laying down the foundation to make us great electronic system designers. Now, as I keep telling you, please pay attention to these fundamentals, okay? There are more important things you have to know before you start designing circuits, so have that patience. Okay, now, in, in the next lecture, we will look at the periodic table. We will also talk about electron configuration and how valence electrons determine the electrical or even the chemical properties of material. And gradually, we are building a firm foundation to help us understand the uh, operations of electronic devices and also build them with ease. All right, uh, thank you for watching. See you in the next lecture.